Thanks, Marina. Thanks so much for coming and joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, look, can we start perhaps at the beginning, which is always a good place to start. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about Robo Girls and tell us a bit about what the passion was behind that. Okay. Um, so when I was in year 12, I didn't know anything about engineering, but then I went to a four-day engineering camp held in Brisbane and I got to learn about engineering. I got to shoot water rockets into the sky, um, make robots out of Lego, make little catapult things and I had a lot of fun and I was like, engineering is so cool, you get to change the world by building things and using maths and science to do it. Now I know why maths and science exist. And um, um, anyway, I, so I didn't know much else about engineering and I, I come from Cairns in far north Queensland um, and, and there weren't many girls in my, um, in my maths and physics classes but I thought once I get down to Melbourne to study there's going to be so many people including lots of girls just as passionate about engineering, passionate about technology as I am. So I went down to Melbourne and it took me the whole semester before I found out that there were only five girls in my course out of the 50 people taking it. So like when you're in first year you take classes with like 300 people and you don't know who's in your class and who's not. Um, so yeah, it took me the whole first semester before I was like, wow, there are only five girls and now I know all of them. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, in my second year at uni I started a project building robots with a group of friends and I approached the head of the electrical engineering department for some funding um, and he said that he was interested in getting a group of uni students together to go to a school to teach a year six girls robotics as a way to get them interested in engineering. And I went away and thought about it and, and I thought, you know, this could actually work. We could actually see more uh, women in engineering through this. I could, I could have more girls in my class. Um, and it can make a huge difference. And I thought, well, rather than just going to one school, why don't we go to all the schools? And so I read up a plan and I recruited all my friends during my exam period. Um, and then as soon as my exams were over, I went to see uh, the professor, Professor Jamie Evans, and I said, here's my plan. This is what I'm gonna do over the next three months. Uh, and um, he said, who are you gonna do it with? And I said, here are 24 of my friends that have signed up. Uh, and he said, like, um, you know, what do you need? And I said, oh, I just need a room from you on Tuesday at 9 a.m. and I need some robots from you. And he was like, and at the end I said, oh yeah, by the way, will you fund my robot? And he said, if you can make all this happen, I'll, I'll fund your robot. <laughs> and um, so yeah, I made it happen. Wow. Yeah. So in terms, of, in terms of that first step, I mean, a lot of things that we kind of teach in sort of building an organisation or, or thinking about an organisation is kind of culture is everything. How did, you, how did you sort of build that culture? I mean, you had friends for a start, and then kind of how did everyone keep enthusiastic and how did you keep the, the culture alive, or how did you get the message out? Well, I only had, I only had about three months to do the project. Uh -huh. um, because after my exams finished, uh, it was July, and then at the end of September, I was going to London for a year to study at Imperial College in London. And so I had three months to make it work, which was also really good because I, finished uni for the semester and I didn't have uni, I didn't have any other commitments, so I just had three months to work on it. Um, uh, so yeah, I recruited, like I said, I recruited 24 of my friends, four of, the, um, four of them showed up, so <laughs> it's always good to, <laughs> I don't know, maybe they weren't all friends, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I, I guess like, because we had that timeline of three months, we set like, we set our goals for those three months, we set ambitious goals and we said we're going to get there. Because we had such a small timeline, we just had to run and run and run and run to get there, and um, and and we ran, yeah. And what were the really important things do you think you did back then that really made a difference in that in that really short timeline of three months? Um, I I listened to people. I uh, so yeah, with the initial uh, people that showed up, um, like by day, by week two. Um, I was thinking, okay, what roles can they, what roles can they do in the organisation? And I thought, oh, this girl, she might be good as a secretary to, to like sign the papers for our incorporation. And so I said, okay, you know, who wants to be secretary? Who wants to sign? Who wants to be the name on our incorporation application? And um, I was thinking of one girl in particular, but another girl, Kelly. She's like, I want to do it. Me, me, me. I'm like, Kelly, it's yours then. You can do it. <laughs> and then, um, and then. 
you know, another thing we had to do was course schools. And I thought, well, Anshi, she's a bit like, she's not afraid to talk to people. So I said, hey, Anshi, um, we need someone to course schools. Uh, would you like to take on that role? And she said, huh, no, not really. I like building robots. I want to build the robotics challenge that we're doing. Um, you know, I think it's really fun and I'm learning a lot and, um, and I really like it. And I said, okay, fine, yeah, you can do the lessons. Um, and then the fourth girl, she was a bit quiet and I said, what do you want to do? <laughs> she said, I want to, I want to help Anshi with the lessons. And I said, okay, great. So I thought, okay, I have to call the schools. <laughs> and so I did. No one wanted to do it. No one, no one likes cold calling people. So I was like, okay, I got to do it. And so I did. And then, um, and then, and then I found, and I, I guess in the early days as well, um, we tried to recruit more people. So it was really good that I had the head of electrical engineering um, who, was, who was, you know, championing the project. Because I was like, hey, Jamie, uh, we need to recruit some more volunteers. Could you send this out to all the students in engineering? He's like, yeah, sure. And, uh, and you know, within like the first um, three weeks, we had like 80 signed up volunteers. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, most of my first committee, they were all my friends. I had like 13 people in my committee in, that, in those first three months. Um, you know, I had my friend who lived down the hall from me, he was our treasurer. Uh, I had a friend's friend who designed the logo, uh, who was a creative design manager. Um, one of the other girls in the hall who was studying to be a teacher, she became the school's manager. But then she said that the whole thing was too disorganised and, and she quit after like a week. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, okay, back to me again. Um, you know, it was all... It was all just like... It was all really haphazard, actually. Uh -huh. But we just kept going and just kept... I mean, I, I guess I had a game plan, and the game plan was like, this is what we'll achieve in three months, uh, this is what we'll achieve in the first month, the second month, third month, and it was all really simple stuff, like core five schools, core ten schools, core twenty schools, um, uh, book a venue for this, uh, get a sponsor on board, um, you know, just mm -hmm. really, really basic stuff of what we actually wanted to achieve, not, not getting uh, caught up in the details. Yeah. And so we just, you know, kept working that game plan. Because I guess one of the one of the things that that we often see too is that, and it probably reflects that that um, we sort of teach that you're trying to create a platform, not a process. So almost if you tried to draw a process out of all of those things, it, it may not have worked. But trying to just focus on the outcome or a platform or just get to this point seems to have been a good way for planning for you. Well, I I'd actually read the E Myth before I did this, uh -huh. so that's why everyone in my team, all 13 of the people, they all had specific roles. Um, but having said that, after I went to London, um, I, I, you know, I realised that didn't work, having 13 people, because if you have too many people, then they don't own the project, they don't see it as, as theirs, because they only have such a tiny role to play. So we got rid of that structure, and we said, okay, well, what are the tasks that actually need to be done in order to make a Robogals chapter run? Um, and so we wrote out all the tasks, and we said, okay, well, what, you know, how can we group these tasks together? And out of that, we came up with a new... Um, structure, which which was which is what we're still doing today. Mm -hmm. um, a Ruby House chapter has six positions, and these are the roles, and this is how they're defined, and this is how they work with each other. Um, and and so yeah, in, by like the six month mark, we we had this entirely new structure, entirely new team with six people, um, and, and you know yeah, we had we had some structures in in place, and and since then we've um, since then we've you know we, we always work on the structure, we always work on the processes. Um, so yeah, I guess it's taken us, it, it took us some time to like get there, but we got there. Um, I mean, so when I went to London, I thought I want to start up Ruby Gals here in London, but I was really overwhelmed because London's huge and I'd never like worked in such a big place before. Um, but after I was, but I was like, I, I have no idea what's going on. I can't do anything here. Like, <laughs> but after I was there for three months, I realized that there were no girls in engineering at Imperial College. They were like, 15 girls out of 150 in mechanical engineering. There were four girls out of 120 in computer science. Like two girls out of 17 in aerospace engineering. So I was like, you know, I, I'm bubble. the one. I have to do this. And um, so, yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, no one showed up to the first couple of, the first two Ruby Girls meetings. So I just sat there and cried. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I emailed everyone and I said, we had a really productive meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, when are you free again? And, um, and then by the, by the time I left London, I, I had a really great team and we, you know, we had our second chapter. But while I was over there, I, I noticed that um, all, the organiza all, all the student organisations in, in the UK, they were national. 
uh, because it's such a small place and it's really easy for people to get around. And I thought, I want Rugby Girls to be national in Australia. And so, yeah, I set about organising that here in Australia. Wow. And, um, and yeah, that, that first conference we ran, it was just, it, I, it went really, really well. But it was also, you know, I was just really lucky that it went really well because I had um, my team around me who, who, <coughs> Who I was like, okay, well we need to, you know, run a, we need to run an activity now for our 20 participants who've come from all over Australia and who are all female engineering students from like um, University of New South Wales, University of Queensland, um, University um, of uh, Adelaide, University of Western Australia. Uh, I said, you know, and, and and my team just like pulled together and, and I said, you know, I delegated some different sessions for them to run and they. They did it and all went smoothly, and I thought, oh, that went so well. I'm going to do the same thing in London. I know I, I, I'm going to go back there in six months' time and like expand Rover Girls all throughout the UK. Um, and I, I thought, no, I've got, I've got some experience. I've done it once in Australia. I should be awesome at this next time around. And so there were 42 people that went to that uh, conference in, in, in the UK, uh, except I didn't have my team around me, and uh, that was a <laughs> That was, that was a challenging weekend. Um, <laughs> so I got back from that, and, and um, after the first conference, we decided, oh, this, this should be an annual event so that people from all over the country can meet each other and upskill and get to know each other. And so after I came back from London, I was like, crap, I have to start preparing for the next um, conference in Australia. And, and you know, at the same time, we had 13 chapters around Australia, and I was, um, I was with their mentor. <laughs> once a month, so 13 mentoring calls a month, as, lo as well as my own little team, as well as organising this conference. And, uh, and at that point it was like, wow, we need some really good processes and structures in place. And, um, and so that's what we did. It kind of all imploded um, about two months after I came back from London. And, uh, and I was on holiday in Asia and, and I was so stressed because of everything that was going on. And, um, and my 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 boyfriend, who was also who was who who became became the CEO of Ruby Gals, um, he, he was like, okay, this isn't working. Um, you know, what 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 do you actually have to do before September? And I was like, you know, we wrote out four pages of things that, that had to be done. He was like, hey, you know, let's do it. And we set up. You know, we drew we drew a diagram of what the structure would look like. We started writing all of our manuals. Um, we just put structure around the whole thing and. And uh, you know, after we ran that um, our second conference in, in Australia, it was just things just got a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So processes and structures are really important. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like giving up? Yeah, all the time. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> like all the time, like every day. <laughs> <laughs> just this morning. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but but with Rover Gals, I think something that really motivated me all throughout was that like, right, right from day one, I had a team around me who were working on the project. And so even when I was in my head about something, I'd, I'd get an email or a phone call from someone in my team saying, hey, Maria, look what I've done. And I'm like, oh, wow, there's people that are working on this as well. I better do my stuff. And then, you know, it's really motivating, I yeah. think, to have a team. Um, and, and then once I'd grown it to 13 chapters around the world and, and I was like, wow, this is really overwhelming. <laughs> You know, I thought about, oh, you know, should I just give this all up? But then I thought, no, I can't do that because there's 13 chapters. There's, there's like 80 people around the world that are working at least 10 hours a week on this project. And I need to, I need to step up and do my role so that they actually feel like they're getting value from what they're doing and, and um, they feel motivated. And, um, and, I, and I just believed, you know, if I just stick at this and, and, and make it work, make it, make it um, you know, really flesh it out, then it can be sustainable, and and yeah, that that was, you know, it's 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 a tough emotional journey being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think the I think the f picture that most aptly like describes it is um is like a person just huddled in the corner, like rocking. <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I doing? <laughs> what about what about um, people around you at the time, in yeah. terms of people like your like your boyfriend, like your mum, like. People around you, in terms of, what did they think of the journey? Did uh, they think you were mad? Yeah, my parents certainly did. They were like, "What are you doing with your life, Marita? Like, yeah. what are you doing?" Because there was a point where I was like, "What?" There was a point where I was like, 
what should I do? Like, if I were to do this other thing for Ruby Gals, I'll need to spend a lot more time on it. I'll need to, like, really go all in and kind of neglect my studies mm -hmm. at the same time. Because I was a, I was a full-time student for, for, like, the whole of Ruby Gals, actually. Um, a full-time engineering computer science student. And, and I thought to myself, you know, in 10 years' time, the skills that I'm learning from Ruby Gals will be, like, worth so much more to me than, than my uni degree. I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. And I just dove into it. Um, and, and my parents were like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I have those thoughts, but it's not like I talk about them all the time. Yeah. It's, it's just like, yeah, they're there, and you're like, okay. <laughs> but I think um, knowing that the team helped me, knowing that having a team structure around me like, was a good emotional support for me, meant that for the current startup that I'm doing, I was like, okay, right, first thing I need is I need people to work with. I need a team around me, because I know they motivate me. Because you could have, I mean, jumping onto that just a minute, you could have done Rubber Girls for the term of your natural life, I guess. It could, it's, it's sort of got a life of its own now, right? Um, but obviously you have to break clear of that at some stage or break, break away so that you can do stuff that you want to do. How hard was that? It was, yeah, it was really hard. Um, I think I always knew that I wanted um, to leave Rubber Girls when I graduated from uni um, because I... I saw that that was the best way to sustain it. That was the best way to make sure it could live on for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, um, because you need, you need people with fresh ideas, uh, with, with fresh energy. Um, and, and it's the way that the whole organisation is run. There's always, I mean, it's a university student-based mm -hmm. organisation. So, you know, people are only at uni for like four years, you know, maybe six. Yeah. Uh, and so they're only going to be with the organisation for like a couple of years, a few years, um, four years, five years at most. Um, and and I, just, I just saw that it was really healthy to have that energy, have, that, um, have those new ideas. Um, so I thought, you know, I don't want to be the bottleneck on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess you would have seen already the way teams are working in a different environment now. You're in a, um, you know, almost a volunteer organisation or wherever you're being that, that way, you must have had instances where the whole team wasn't working the one way, that they're all working in different directions and they're all volunteers. How do, how do you cope with that? I, so all my volunteers, they always had, like in my team, they always had a set role to do. Um, and so what I, used, what I used to do is, would have a team meeting like every fortnight and then um, every week I would meet with each of my team members individually and just find out where they were at, where they were at and how I could support them. Um, but I really think that yeah, the role of a leader is to support everyone in your team and make sure they have what they need in order to do their roles properly. Um, and I think that if they know that you have their back and they're loyal to you and they want to do their best. So do you think those, those lessons will be useful now in your kind of... I, yeah, I mean there were some really tough situations when I was, when I was doing Ruby Gals. Like, so many times there are, projects are just not going to happen. Um, and I, um, and like, for example, like three, three weeks out of a, a, an event happening or four weeks out of an event happening or whatever, I'll be like, okay, this is, you know, this is just not going to happen. Then I'll be like, hey, Marita, you're just going to go, you're just going to go into it. You're just going to do it, like, to the best of your ability up until the event because you're going to, like, if you can get through this, if you can get to the other side of this, you're going to be so much stronger, so much better than you ever knew yourself to be. And I don't know what that's, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I just know that you're going to be better. And so I'll just dive in and do it and do it and do it and do it and do it. And, you know, at the end of it, after I'd done it, I'll be like, wow, I'm so, I'm, you know, I was proud of myself that I did my best. And um, I was like, you know, this is what I learned, you know, and, and then I took those skills with me to the next stage. Um, so I think... Yeah, for me, like, the thing that I really loved about Ruby Girls was that I was always just challenging myself to learn more and more and more. And I was challenging everyone in my team to learn more and more. And I, I, didn't, want, I didn't want people in my team that, that weren't being challenged and that, um, you know, didn't love their role. So, so hard work's a pretty key ingredient to all this. Yeah, exactly. Just, and, it, it, it is. It is. And almost sometimes you don't know what that work might be, but it's just a lot of hard work. It's just doing whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I throw a quote at you and see what you think in terms of um, um, 
Henry Bergson said, it's the very essence of intelligence to coordinate means with a view to a remote end and undertake what it does not feeling, not feeling absolutely sure of carrying it out. In other words, not knowing what you're actually doing, but just pushing towards that end. Almost no wonder. It sounds like stupidity, not <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> but I definitely see that. In, I definitely see that in entrepreneurship. Yeah. But it's just like, okay, you know, let's just do that, and then you work towards it. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if it's intelligence. Yeah, it's sort of not knowing the exact steps. But, but it's just how you get stuff it done. In. It's yeah, how you get exactly. stuff done. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, some folk also define entrepreneurship or that sort of process as dealing beyond your resources. In other words, you know, you've got a set of resources today, and the big goal that you have doesn't necessarily always contemplate the resources that you might need along the way, but you kind of get there in the end. Is that sort of been, when you think about where you started, is that sort of, now you look back and you look at all the resources that, that you know, are there now, you probably didn't contemplate that right from the, the beginning. Well, I think it's um, all just about, well, what do I want to achieve? What do I need? Like the simplest ingredients that I need in order to get there. Um, and then, okay, how do I get the, how do I get those simple ingredients? You know, like hi buying all those robots that could have cost a lot of money. Hiring a room to do stuff in that could have cost a lot of money. But you know, if I just ask a um, university professor who has those resources at hand, and and I have him see, well, he was the one that you know wanted to do the project in the first place, so that was mm -hmm. easy to convince him to give me all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I remember early on in the project, I thought to myself, well, we don't have a lot of money in terms of sponsorship. But we have all these universities around the world that have like donated robots and donated um, rooms, like all this in-kind support. And I don't know how much that total is in terms of money, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's there's so much stuff out there that you just have to um, you know find out how you can get access to. And it, yeah, it's kind of like resources that other people don't see sometimes, right? So in other words, they're there, but no one necessarily uses them in that way. Exactly. Or not using them properly, if you like, for, a, for an objective. Exactly. So, next steps in terms of where you want to go, after all that learning, what do you think will be next for you in um, terms of this, this journey of learning, if you like? Well, so I handed over my organisation at the end of last year, at the end of 2012. Um, so, that, that, you know, I, knew, I always knew that I wanted to do it. So, about two years before that, I thought to myself, like, crap, I don't know what to do, you know? How do I, how do I set this up such as someone wants to take on my role? And, and um, so I signed up to like do fellowships and stuff in order to just ask more people about it. And, and I just had so many conversations that even after that one year of conversations, I was like, I, you know, no one has the answer for me. And, and I was like, okay, I have to figure it out myself. <laughs> and I, um, and so I, I got some really great support from um, some of the people that I'd spoken to, and um, and we, we talked about all these different business models, like all these different structures, and then finally we were like, you know, we just finally we were like, well, we work with female engineering students. They're they're smart people, um, and we thought, well, you know, anyone could have done what um, what I what me and my COO had done, as long as I mean, they have the smarts for it. Like the female engineering, they have the smarts for it. They just need the hard work. They just need the time. Um, and so that, you know, when we, when we realised that, we're like, okay, that makes it a bit easier. And then we thought, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty unique. Like, we, we've had, you know, four years of experience doing this. The people that we find won't, won't be exactly like us. But, you know, what, what are the, skill, what are the um, skills or the capabilities? What projects do they need to have, been, to have done in order to, in order to be able to lead this organisation? We wrote all that down. And, um, and then, yeah, we wrote up some like job descriptions and stuff. And then it got to a stage where um, I was ending up one of my fellowships that I was doing. And one of the goals that I had for my fellowship was I'll have a plan in place to, to step down from my organization. And my mentor came and saw me and she said, well, what have you done in this regard? And I said, well, you know, we've got these plans. And she said, well, what have you done? And I'm like, Aah. and she said, do something. And I'm like, okay. And, <laughs> and I was like, well, we could, I, and I thought, well, we could either like put out an ad on like the, um, on the job sites and, and advertise it and I'll take, you know, a couple of rounds and who knows who will apply or, uh, and, or, or we could just like, and, or I thought, well, you know, why don't I just get Nicole to do it because she's awesome. <laughs> and so I called Nicole into my office like half an hour after the mentor left and I said, Nicole, I want to offer you a role. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and she accepted, the, she, you know, she was really flattered. She saw her opportunity for herself and like three weeks later she, she, she accepted. And, um, and then about a month after that, we, we, you know, we, we, 
we did the same thing with the CEO position because we're like, we don't know who's going to be the new CEO. But then, but then at the conf at the conference like the month earlier, we noticed someone who we thought had really great organisational skills and who had yeah. a really systematic mind. And we thought, well, you know, why don't why don't we get Sam? And so we kind of, you know, had a chat with Sam, and <laughs> and you know, they're our new CEO and CEO. And as soon as we chose them. I was like, right, so Nicole's got three months. She needs to learn about you know, sponsorship. Run, run, uh, uh, uh. I was like, hey, so Nicole, you're in charge of our relationship with this Fortune 500 company. And uh, <laughs> Nicole, you're, doing, you're managing that event now, and you're managing these people, and you're doing that. And, uh, and she's like, okay. And she took it all on board, and she didn't. And then you know, by the end of that three months, we were like, well, you know, she's got experience in all those fields. And, and uh, you know, I'm there if she ever needs me, and go for it, Nicole. And uh, yeah, she's doing great. And you're happy to let go? Um, well, yes. <laughs> so like, I officially let go probably like three months after that. Um, after we, I went to UK and ran a conference there, um, the, my final one that I ran. And then I ran one in the, in the USA. And after that conference, I was like, wow, I'm free. And then I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do with my time? And um, so I started a company like less yeah. than a month later. As you do. Yeah, because I was, I was like, I've got to do something. You know, <laughs> otherwise, you, my, my mind just goes, I don't know, my mind thinks too much, I think. And then if I don't have like a big problem that I'm thinking about, then it's just, you know. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's better to have something that I focus my attention on that actually achieves something for the world rather than just... Yeah. You're spinning around. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. You mentioned mentors yeah. a couple of times. There must be some mentors that you listen to and some that you don't. Um, so How do you pick the ones that you listen to? Yeah, I, I'm... I, so with mentors, I, I didn't really have any mentors, like as in an official mentor throughout the whole of my time with Robo Gals. Um, I just watched a lot of talks like online, like TED Talks and business plan talks and, and like read lots of blogs to get lots of ideas about things. Um, and yeah, I just spoke to, a, I spoke to a lot of people. Um, and if I had a problem that I thought someone had the skill set for solving, I would send them an email and say, hey, I, could you give me some advice on this or could you give me some advice on that? And yeah, and people would send me emails back and say, this is my advice. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have like an official mm -hmm. mentor. I, just, like, I guess I have the whole world as my mentor. And you choose better. to listen to what, what might make sense at the time, well, right? Well, I, I, um, I listen to everything and then I decide what will be the best course of action for me. Because I think that whatever, um, whenever someone gives you advice, it's all based on like their experience and, um, and their situation at the time. And that might be different to your situation, your, um, your context at the time. So ultimately, you're responsible for your own decisions that you make. And so you know, you've got to weigh up everything and then choose and then be responsible for your choice. So when, when all the problems become too big and that mind isn't quite working them out, where do you go? What do you do? Uh, well, big problems always start from small problems. <laughs> so you've got to nip them in the bud before they become big problems. And then you have to worry about them. And, you know, I think it all usually comes down to people. Uh -huh. Like, that's, a, that's the hardest thing, you know? I, I remember reading when I was um, in my first year that um, more companies fail in their first year due to people problems more so than any other problem, more so than like, lack of technical ability. It's just people problems. And I thought, well, yeah, Robo Gals is a great experience because I'm working with people all the time. And if I can manage, if I can manage hundreds of volunteers, then like when I have employees, it's going to be a piece of cake compared <laughs> to this. You know, compared to like <laughs> getting people to do stuff for free. You know, yeah. if you're paying them, um, you know, they, they've already got that commitment. Um, but then if on top of that, you know, you can inspire them, you can, um, you, if, if I can bring all those skills that I use with volunteers to, to my employees, then who knows what they can create. So we, we kind of also say that innovation flows through people, right? So it's not necessarily a, a patent or a neat technology, it's the people that make all those things mm. kind of work. Yeah. You deal with a lot of technical people kind of an engineering yeah. or, or, or get amused by the technology and amused by the problems that that, that yeah. has. How's that a challenge for the people you work with in terms of perhaps communicating or getting everyone else to understand that it happens through I don't know. People? I think it's really, gr I, li I mean, everyone I've worked with, I, um, I, I think that the main thing is that your expectations have to be aligned. I mean, if you're expecting this and they're expecting that, then 
it's not going to work. You need to both yeah. like have really clear expectations and to always communicate so that your expectations are are, are well founded and you're on the same page. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to work. So yeah, I think communication is really really important. And um, like I said, yeah, big problems they all stem from little problems and and um, and, and mostly yeah, it's about people. So if you're communicating with them and um, and yeah, I mean, then then you don't have that. Yeah, sometimes, because I guess sometimes it sounds like you've got people out of their comfort zones, talking to people they didn't know they needed to talk to, cold calling, all those sorts of things, as well as sometimes having them just do the thing they like doing, rather yeah, than yeah. necessarily uh, doing anything they don't want to do. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, you've got to be prepared to ask some questions. Um, I, for, for example, if I'm mentoring someone and I say, well, you know, Oh, you know, how about we do this? So, oh, okay. So I like to have people set their own goals, yeah. Um, because, uh, so, yeah. If I have, if I have an idea, I'll be like, oh, this is my idea, rah, rah. and I say, okay. So you know, we're gonna get there by then. But I want you to set your own goals, um, and then they'll set them. And I say, oh no, I don't think that's quite, you know, big enough or pr precise enough. You know, I, I I think you can do better than that. And then you know, they'll they'll uh, they set, so they set their own goals with my guidance, and then. Uh, <laughs> And then I can say to them, you know, you set your own goals. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just holding you to do your word when I mentor mm -hmm. you. Um, and, I mean, if they write something down with, um, and, and then I say, yeah, do you think, so, yeah, so this is what you'll do over the next week. How does that sound? And if they're a bit unsure, I'll be like, you know, what's there for you about that? And they, they might say, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't like calling people. I don't think they want to hear from me. They go, oh, you know, the thing is, you don't know well, if you, if you have, if you haven't like called them, you know they might be thinking this is. They might like pick up your call and be like, "This is the best thing in the whole world," and they might like you know use that to transform the whole school. And maybe one of the girls in that class is the next Mark Zuckerberg. You never know. Yeah. And and they're like, "Oh, okay," and then they go and do it. So it's almost like managing their goals and managing them by goals rather than necessarily the itty bitty of what they do, but holding them accountable to those goals. Um. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't. Well, hold, it's just holding them accountable to. Yeah, ta tasks. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah you're, you're right. Yeah, yeah, outcomes. Yeah. So I'll give you another quote. So what you think of this? Winston Churchill said something around the. He said, "The maximum nothing prevails, but perfection may be spelt paralysis." <laughs> well, yeah, there's a really good quote. It's um, uh, paralysis by analysis, and engineers are apparently very good at that. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you do that? Uh, No, because <laughs> I get impatient. Um, I, I get impatient. I'm like, oh, but um, I need to set really short-term goals um, to motivate me. Otherwise, like, I, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I always, um, I always set like three-month goals, actually, because I think that if you set like a month one, one-month goal, that's too short of a time, and you can get um, demotivated and not not work towards your goal. But if you have like a three-month goal. Um, uh, that that inspires you. Then you can work towards it. You can get demotivated, but then you know you re-motivate yourself and you keep working towards it. And then at the end, at the end of three months, even if you don't get there, at least you're like twenty percent of the way. And you're like, wow, I can't believe I achieved like twenty percent of my like big hairy audacious goal yeah. in like three months. And uh, now I have to keep going. <laughs> um, uh, so um, yeah, I I I mean I I think um. I, mean, I think in RoboGals, we just try to give people autonomy to uh, come up with their own ideas and execute them, and, and we allow people room to fail. Um, so, I mean, there was an event that I mentored someone to run, and um, it didn't go as well as we'd hoped. And, um, and, and I think she was really disappointed. Um, what I said to her after the event was, I'm really sorry. Um, I, I take responsibility for not, like, Mentoring you more and uh, throughout the whole process, and, and not being there for you more, um, in order for us to actually achieve our goal. But um, you know, we learnt a lot from it, and we're going to use all, all that stuff we learnt and have and make this event work the way that we want it to in in um, four months' time. And we did. The next event we ran was so successful and so amazing. So mistakes are part of the process. It's part of the process. Yeah, but I think. Um, um, yeah, if you're if you're working with people, like, um, you know, sourcing sourcing where you're responsible for what went wrong, and um, yeah, just making sure that people know that you've got their back, and so, then they'll have yours. Yeah. So it's not always creating blame on the person, but taking the blame as a as a group. 
Um, well, yeah, but I mean, doing that authentically. Yeah. Like, you don't want to just say, oh, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. But like, you know, really looking at well, what could I have done in order to have really made a difference. So, when I was talking about entrepreneurs dealing beyond their resources, I imagine you do that with your own time. How do you, how do you kind of turn one day into two days, which I imagine you must do a fair bit? Um, I, see, I, I don't, I don't think of growth linearly. Mm -hmm. I think that growth is like, growth is like all over the place. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know, something I like to do is just like, think about what's, like every now and then just thinking about, okay, what's actually happening here? Like, where are we heading? Um, what, what other opportunities, what other things have I seen in the world um, that, that could mean that um, we change the way that we get to our goal. Um, how, can I take, how can I take advantage of the opportunities that are out there? Um, and I'll just sit and think and then, and then write those things down. I'll be like, and, and you know, sometimes you come up with things that will help you get to your goal like five times quicker. And um, yeah, and I think, you know, when I sit and think and come up with those ideas, you know, they're more productive than like working for like a whole month, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like doing, sometimes we explain in kind of commercialisation or that sort of growth phase, you're on, not doing the, the steps in order sometimes. You're sometimes doing the last step first, almost, to try and get you to where you need to go. Does that kind of make steps? We're not, we're not necessarily doing a whole list of things, it's more about what thing can I do now? Yeah. So it'll pull those other things along. Yeah, but I think it's also like believing in what you're doing um, such that you can like such a can step ten, 10 steps ahead. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it, that doesn't sound good. You don't, you don't skip them, you just like, um, I mean, you, you get them done, you need to yeah. get them done. Like, you need to get every step done, like, properly. Along the way, right. Like, with integrity. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, there, I mean, there are steps that you can take that, um, to set things up for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, some relationships, they take a long time to develop. You need to, like, start, start those relationships earlier so that in six months' time, you already have that relationship um, that you can call on. So how important are those relationships to you now in jumping out and doing something new or doing, doing anything that you want to do from here on in? Uh, well, I think that, um, I think that, yeah, whatever you want to do, you need to form relationships within that field. So, um, yeah, so it, it's different. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But the skills are probably the same in terms of in terms of knowing how to build those relationships and knowing how to help people get their goals and all those sorts of things. Um, sure. And I think I think that all just boils down to being interested in other people and because um, I think people can see through like if you're not interested in other people yeah. and if you're just um, you know, if you're fake, I think people can see through that. So you gotta yeah, be genuine about um, yeah, about about who you are and who they are, and um, and it all stems from that. I'm gonna give you some. So clips. I think, like, yeah, I think yeah. it's important that rather than trying to change everything like on the outside, changing things on the inside, um, because that's what shines through. Did, did you always think the sort of entrepreneurial process was good? The entrepreneur. What but do you mean? In other words, pursuit of of markets and growth and all those sorts of things. Is that a a thing you've always kind of been drawn to, or is it more just getting an objective out there? Is it, is it the pursuit of um, the entrepreneurship way of either making money or whatever it might be, or is it more just getting your stuff out there? Well, I always, um, I was really inspired by the Google guys and by Steve Jobs when I was in high school. And I think what inspired me was that um, they were, I mean, the Google guys were, were in their 20s, um, the Apple guys, um, 21 and 25, when they, when they founded their companies. And I thought, it's so amazing that in this day and age, like if you're young, even if you're young, you can use technology and create huge impact in the world in a really short space of time. And that's what inspired me, that you could actually create tangible change in the world that like change people's lives in, in a short space of time. And, and, you know, and, I, and I just saw that the vehicle for doing that was starting a company. Cool. I'm gonna ask you five questions, and I've, you've probably heard these before. Okay. What word do you really hate? Um, yeah, I, I, I dislike negativity. <laughs> uh, yeah, like when people are negative, it just, it's just like, uh, uh. so like, is, 
so if I have a project, I'm like, oh my god, this is gonna work because of this, this, and this, and this. Really, you haven't thought about it. I'm like, oh, shut up. <laughs> like, we'll sort that out, you know? Or like, when I'm like, oh, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Like, just people like, you know, you know, you got this bubble and it's getting bigger and bigger, and people like getting needles out and poking it and deflating it. It's like it's such a killjoy. It's like. <laughs> Just play, you know, just play with it for a while. <laughs> so, um, yeah. How would you describe what you do to a five-year-old? I, I, uh, <laughs> I play with robots <laughs> and I make stuff happen. I don't know. That's good enough. Okay. That's pretty good for a five-year-old. Okay, great. You're cool in some way. <laughs> <laughs> At your funeral, what would you most like to hear someone say about you? She, she was a great person who really, I don't know, <laughs> 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 who, uh, who, who really cared about people and who made a difference in the lives of, who, who made a difference in the world to the lives of billions. Cool. What, what profession would you least like to know? Ooh. Oh, someone who works like, I don't know, <laughs> mental image of someone like wearing a full on body suit, wading into syrup. Um, <laughs> That's the first thing that came to my head. I That's not fun. <laughs> yeah. That's a robot's job, I would have thought. Yeah, exactly. What, would, what, what sound do you like the most? Uh, oh, people are smiling and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the sound of success and laughing. Great. Thanks very much, Marina. Thanks Great. for your time today. Thank you.